It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a medical doctor and I'm doing a PhD in clinical genomics, but my real passion has been for the last seven, eight years to help patients and physicians get closer to social media. So I've been developing tools, applications, solutions for them, uh, for both stakeholders. So let me start with emphasizing one thing here. Social media, or Web 2.0, is really changing communication in medicine these days. Let me give you one example for that. I guess you know Conor O'Brien, the US television star. Uh, NBC fired him last year. It meant that for some months, he didn't have healthcare coverage. So on Twitter, he sent a message to his followers saying that, I no longer have healthcare. Could someone show this picture to dermatologists and get back to me? And he attached the picture. Here it is. This is a mole, nothing serious. One of my friends from the US, a doctor, replied to him on Twitter saying that, Conan, I am a hematologist, but looking at that, I give you seven months. Don't worry, that's a really long time. <laughs> so communication between physicians and patients is absolutely changing these days. But why is this change? Why do we have to talk about social media in medicine and healthcare? Um, I have a story about that. I have a very good friend from Netherlands. His name is Martin. And uh, Martin was, let me tell you his story. He's the real e-patient in my mind, in my perspective. Martin was a communication specialist and he just started a mobile startup. He's one of the developers behind the uh, world famous app Liar the, the, with the augmented reality. And when um, he started his company, the, after some weeks, he had some strange symptoms in, the, in his chest. He went to the doctor, he had some x-rays and CTs, and at the end, he got this. Um, a mass in his mediastinum, one of the worst places to have cancer in, in your body, is a CT scan. And as he was a real communication specialist, he thought that he should be quite clear, quite open about this whole thing that's happening to him. So, as, so he started a blog to communicate openly about his own disease. But he had a strategy. He wanted to get feedback from patients from around the world. So he launched his blog, Martin's Journey, and he started sharing everything about his own disease. He made uh, interviews with uh, other patients in the hospital, with doctors. He published the first photo uh, during the first shot of chemotherapy, the first round of chemotherapy. And then he had, a, he had many friends to visit him, so he created a schedule on Google Docs, and, and friends could check in at what time they can visit him day by day. He also published a video when he had to lose his hair due to chemotherapy. He decided to shave his hair, created a YouTube video out of it. It was real fun. He published the video. It became a social, short, socially famous video. And that's how he tried to, you know, help other patients deal with their problem, with their cancer. And then he, get, he got a comment on his blog from a patient from the US saying that, I have an advice for you. I had the same disease and we did something else uh, in, at this point of my disease. Please contact my US oncologist. He did, he contact the, contacted the US oncologist who told him perfectly that sorry I cannot help you, I cannot give medical advice online, but please connect me to your oncologist in the Netherlands. So the peers were connected and they, they decided with Martin to do something else, another step in the therapy. And then he published this post after we told two years ago that he is cancer free and he still is. So for me, this is a real e-patient story. That's how e-patients use social media and internet to get feedback, to get help, to get opinions from others uh, from around the world. He is the real patient in my mind. But this is about medicine and healthcare. And even if there are some great stories in different perspectives, we have to stick to what I have been sticking to in the last few years uh, since I become, uh, became a medical doctor. This is evidence-based medicine. I'll give you one example why I mention this right now. I guess you know Google Trends, in which you can check the number of search queries for different search terms, such as uh, the more people look for Lady Gaga or Britney Spears. And at Google, a few years ago, they found out that if in a, US, a specific US state, the more people do a search for flu symptoms, then probably there is a flu outbreak in that specific uh, uh, country. Because people go home, they feel sick, they do searches for the flu symptoms. And that's why they created Google flu trends that try to predict the response, the real, the real flu outbreaks, just based on the number of flu symptom queries in Google. I think it was a fantastic idea. It was social, it was interactive. And then, a few months later, at the, at the end of last year, a new study came out from the US concluding that Google flu trends is not as accurate as CDC national surveillance programs. 
It's social, it's cool, it's colorful, it's interactive, but it's useless in medicine and healthcare. And that's why we have to stick to evidence-based medicine, even in social media. There are uh, dozens of articles day by day about how to use Twitter, Facebook, blogs, YouTube, any kind of social media apps in medicine and healthcare. So today, to talk about real virtual games and health games, I've been a video player, video game player since I was a kid. I love these games and I would like to use these in, in, in medicine and healthcare as well. So I brought you five groups of examples focusing on five different aspects of virtual gaming and healthcare. First, let's see some social games. A few days ago, we had a new campaign. Uh, we saw that in the blogosphere. It was launched by the Mayo Clinic, I believe the best example for what the hospital can do in social media. Mayo Clinic launched this campaign, the Know Your Numbers campaign, with a funny uh, parody video in which they tried to raise awareness on the importance of your numbers, blood pressure, uh, your body mass index, your lipid numbers, lipid values in the blood, to use it for predicting or, uh, or preventing heart diseases. And they created a social campaign in which people can uh, participate in a competition. If they can share the video with more and more people, they get more and more points. And at the end, they have grand prizes. Another example for social health is when you try to uh, convince people to take part in anti-obesity challenges. In the Minnesota um, competition, people from that specific county could, could join, join this movement and they had a weight leaderboard, and that's how they tried to motivate people. If they, they formed teams with people they didn't even know ar around their location, and then with these teams, they could win grand prizes. That was a fantastic project with real social health perspectives. And then sometimes an email is enough. I tried it myself, that's called daily challenge. Um, it lets me know about, I let it know about my, my features. I would like to lose weight. I would like to do more exercises. And every day it sends me an email with some challenges. Like for example, yesterday I got an email that I should touch my toe. It wasn't a real challenge, but it's just step by step, day by day you get these challenges. And then at the end of the day, you click done and you take these steps further and further in your health management. But I think the best example here is what became Health Month. Um, uh, you may know the I Move You movement from months ago. The I Move You movement and Health Month became one now. It's called Health Month. And in this uh, project, I can choose my rules for this month. I chose now, let's eat whole grains every day. I chose this rule. I can choose, of course, more rules for one month. And then I see how, I, how it evolves. I, can, I have to ask some questions about uh, how much and how many times I eat really whole grains day by day, and then I get my own profile page. It gives me plus points, white cards. It's like a real social game. It's like a game, a video game, but based on health benefits. And that's what it looks like when you have a real profile. That's one of the prof uh, profile of one of the founders. He has a long profile with many do rules and do not rules, just focusing on health and healthcare. The second group I brought to you is about getting rewards for just being healthy. That's it about, that's called earn it. It means that you can use these services, Runkeeper, Fitbit, and so on, to show your exercise bits and, and piece of information. You can share this on Facebook and Twitter, and then you get points for that which you can use for buying real products. So actually, just by being fit, you can buy products for free. The second group of examples is about individuals and kids using these games to improve health and their own health management. I know I have a strange example here, but let me start with this one. When patients can be really creative about their own health. Uh, there was a family in the US uh, about two years ago when the father had to leave the family to work far away from them. But that time the mother was pregnant. The fetus was five months old. And the father didn't want to lose connection with the family. He was a technician, so he designed a sensor for the mother, this one. It meant that whenever the fetus gave a kick, the father got this on Twitter. I kicked mommy at this and that on Thursday, <laughs> December 11th. It somehow connected the family to the father just by one small idea. And months later, there was a message from this Twitter account saying that, hello Twitter, I was born today and maybe I will use Twitter someday soon myself. That was Kigby, the fetus itself. And a few months later, we saw this on their blog. That's now called Kigby. That's a commercial product now in the US. So that, that's, the, that's the way how a good idea from a patient can be transformed into a real product, a real medical product. And this is just about communication. 
Then one of my favorite examples is birth control. Uh, if you are into flash online games, that's, that's a so-called tower defense game. When you have towers and you have to defend your base against perms by using pills, injections, condom, wearing patches and so on. You have to put this here, you have to shoot these perms out. That's a real tower defense game. Really believe me, it can help kids and young teenagers to learn more about these things, to learn more about sexual health. Two examples focusing on young kids. The first is Paco, which is being developed right now. It will be a game not just for the kids, but also for kids and their parents, and it will, let, it will educate them more about nutrition, healthy lifestyle from the, from the ages of five, six, and seven. It's just being developed right now. And one thing from my past, which I worked on, it's called Remission. It's a game for um, um, uh, kids with leukemia. If they use this game, they had some uh, published results about this. Those kids who played this game, in the game you played with Roxy, this character, and you, have, you had to uh, shoot cancer cells and bacteria with those guns that had um, pills the same color that you have to take if you're a kid with leukemia. It was quite realistic. And after kids played with this game, they realized that the compliance was much better with those kids who played the game. These, these uh, gamers became better at knowing and understanding more about their own diseases. That's why such a game can be quite benef uh, beneficial for kids with different types of cancer. My third group is um, one of my favorite ones. It's a researcher in genomics. Collaborative science is something I'm doing day by day. I use my online networks from Facebook to Twitter to get answers for my scientific questions or to, uh, find collaborators in my research. So I was got to see the Genetic Music Project. Uh, I was the first one to publish this on my blog on sciencehall.com a few months ago. Um, a young scientist from Harvard uh, created music based on DNA base pairs of the HIV, of the virus of AIDS. And uh, he, she published this music, and then it became a collaborative project. Now anyone can submit music bits or real songs based on just uh, genetic base pairs of any kind of species in the world. It became quite social. The second one is phylogenomics. Uh, there's a game in here which you can play. Yeah, it's quite easy from this perspective, just playing with colors in different lines. But while you are playing with this game, you are contributing to um, comparative genomic sciences. You don't even know that, but you do that based, because they analyze the patterns based on which you play the game and use the game in different manners. And the third one is the most famous one, Folded, in which they analyze the protein folding, which is a key process in many biologic reactions. And they created Folded. You could download the software and use on your computer when you're, you're not using the, your computer for any other uh, purposes. It, uh, it was running in the background and you, can, you could contribute to science by this. After some months, they published the results in a peer-reviewed journal, and this was the main cover. These tiny bits are the profile pictures of the participants in this project. That was a real success after SETI, the astronomical project years ago. And my favorite group of examples is about medicine and real medical educational examples. Um, when I'm talking about medical games, I'm not just talking about real games, but also things that in communication, in social media, that might make uh, um, processes in medicine more fun than, funnier than before. First, uh, at the Harry Ford Hospital in the US, one year ago, they did live tweeting operations. It meant that they had the operations going on in the background, and they had a resident here tweeting live from TweetDeck about the operation, what's happening minute by minute. If you think that it's a weird thing to do, if uh, you are a patient who will undergo the same operation, you can see what would happen to you minute by minute. If you are a doctor from a third world country who had to perform the same operation, you could see what you should do minute by minute. And also the hospital get, got a huge boost in the online performance because after such live feeding operations, they had hundreds of new followers. Uh, let me tell you my own story. It started as a a um, fun thing to, to, to use. I use Twitter for medical communication. I've been using that for years. I've been building a medical community there for five, six years now. And uh, we had a strange case two years, two years ago when I was a medical student at the hospital, and the, the professors couldn't find the, the real diagnosis. So I thought it could be useful for me as a student to talk about this issue. So I raised this one, this case, 
without, of course, real details about the patient, just the case itself. And I thought that with some other students from around the world, we might discuss it as a part of our medical curriculum. And then for my surprise, on that very day, I received over 200 replies from physicians, medical students, medical lawyers, patients, medical librarians from around the world. We all discussed this case, also reporters um, discussed this with us. We discussed this case and we came up with one potential diagnosis, a quite rare one. I came up with this issue at the next day's grand rounds in the hospital and it turned out to be the diagnosis. So that's, why, that's how we used Twitter for crowdsourcing to get diagnosis, to find the real diagnosis at the end. It was featured in the New York Times because the reporter, uh, Claren Miller, also took active part in the discussion. So we had all the stakeholders from South Africa to Germany through Peru and Brazil, and we could discuss the case, and we all focused on one specific question, to find a diagnosis for, for one particular problem. And then also managing clinical work workflow can be fun. This is at the Southeast Medical Center in the US. They didn't like those black and white worksheets, so they started using Google Docs. That, that is one private document that only the uh, hospital staff can uh, access day by day. You see different columns for different patient, the doctor rooms, different rows for different time points or time slots, and different color codes for different messages, such as the patient was roomed, the patient was discharged, they can leave messages from the, the front desk, from the nursing area. It's automatic. Anyone from the staff can access it. They can edit it simultaneously. Each version is stored automatically, and it's for free. And that's how they could uh, manage to improve the, uh, the uh, efficacy of their uh, clinical workflow by 60% by using a free tool that anyone can uh, learn to use in two or three minutes' time at the hospital. That's one good example. And then I think learning also should be fun and interactive. I'm not talking about medical education right now. I will talk about it later. I'm talking about uh, letting people know about social media and health. I believe that patients and doctors should be able to assess the real quality of medical websites. So on Webisina, we publish the free iPhone Android tools applications on which we help patients and physicians learn more about health 2.0 or social media and health by these interactive games. In these games, we ask questions such as, which was the first medical blog, or how we assess the quality of medical websites. There are hundreds of such questions to help people know more about the internet itself by using the internet as physicians or patients. The way I keep myself up to date is prognosis. This is a real game about case presentations. It's for free, I use it on my Android, I see new cases day by day, I choose this case, I have to read the family history, I have to, I have to uh, investigate the patient, examine the patient, have to choose what kind of uh, investigations I would like to do, what kind of therapies I would choose, and at the end I get a score and I am being reviewed. Mm, I mean step by step, decision by decision. There's a long uh, description at the end about what I have been doing in, the, in this case. For me, that's a perfect example how to keep myself up to date in my own uh, specialty by using games, which are serious games. And then one of my favorite ones from the past was a competition between a, an Australian medical librarian and that search engine, Google, of course. And for one week long uh, period, uh, day by day, they had some tasks to do to find something, a very specific uh, question for a, or answer for a very specific problem and the librarian only used the library's accessories and the, that other librarian used only the search engine. And of course, the librarian won the competition. And it means that we have to use the fantastic power that medical librarians have. That's why we have to talk about this issue day by day. And the last thing here, even if I'm using social media quite massively, I've been using medical games for years now, I believe that we have to, we have to let medical students play offline as well. I use this MRI puzzle game in a Californian conference, which I will talk about later, and it was a perfect example for, for using offline games for the same purposes that we use these games online in social area. So let me get to my real favorite topic, medical education. And um, first, at the, I'm, the, I'm in the organizing committee of the Medicine Meets Virtual Reality Conference in California. I've been there for three years now. And that's one thing I use there, an Xbox-based laryngoscopy. There was a competition at the conference that who can be the, the best laryngoscopologist based on just an Xbox game. It, learned, it helped us learn about 
the lettings itself and how to perform these procedures. And to talk about virtual things here, I'm pretty sure that you all know Second Life, the virtual environment that you can access online. But the question, is, the question here is that whether we need a Second Life at all. And I believe that we do. Uh, for the last few years, Second Life have been going through a, a real educational golden age. And uh, me and my, one of some of my colleagues from around the world, we have been organizing medical events there for four or five years now. It means that in Second Life, we have a virtual hospital, the N. Myers Medical Center. That's a training institute. Uh, I'm sitting right here. We have a professor from the US, medical students from Germany, Peru, Brazil, uh, Hungary, and we have virtual patients as well. We can upload medical uh, family histories, radiology images, blood counts, any kind of media content. We can also listen to the cardiac murmurs of patients, virtual patients, lung sounds. Uh, we can upload this content quite easily, but it costs a few dollars. That's a real problem. That's why we had to choose a different uh, application for that, and I'm glad that we found Visualend, which is a Hungarian based medical um, virtual reality, which we can use for free. It's quite easy to use it, just like Second Life, but it costs, costs nothing to upload your favorite cases, PDFs, any kind of content. And you can also stream your face through webcam in perfect resolution, and it was built mainly for health and medical conferences and events, and you can use that for free at visualand.com. And then uh, we, we used that virtual reality at the, Hungarian, at the Hungarian biggest health portal to create the first virtual cardiology consultation for patients, because these patients have many questions. I believe that there is no difference between the offline and online world. If I can ask something to a doctor in a private form in the offline world, I can do the same in a private form in the online world. This is just communication, nothing else. So we thought that we would create the first virtual consultation in which patients can ask questions to real cardiologists, specialists, in a private form which only the patient and the cardiologist can access, nobody else. And that's why we used the Visualend environment for free. Patients, hundreds of patients came here and they asked their own specific questions to these cardiologists in that private form. They can later send these messages, these discussions to them to, by email, so it still remained private. That was the first cardiology consultation in Hungary. And then, I believe that as you could, see, you could see, there are many examples for improving health, and I believe that improving health itself can be and should be fun. And we should also use this perspective, this aspect, in medical education. Because when a doctor doesn't know anything about virtual games or social health games, I don't think that they can be blamed for that. That's the problem of education. And that's why I believe that, and that's my main line, the main principle here, that digital literacy must be in the medical curriculum. And that's why I launched the world's first and still only university created course that focuses on social media, virtual games and health for medical, dentistry, pharmacy and public health students. It's now an obligatory course at the University of Debrecen in Budapest, the biggest medical school in Central Europe. And I published the majority of my materials on med20course.com and plan to make it an absolutely online course that any medical students from the world can access and can, can do this course from the first pass to the last exams online for free. That's what I'm working on right now. And I also ask these students, one semester is in English, one in Hungarian, and I always ask students before and after the course to fill in a questionnaire so I can see whether their attitude changes during the course about Web 2.0 and medicine. Let me show you only a few examples from that. First, I presented the course at Stanford University two weeks ago because they would like to create something similar in the medical education, and I have the content and material right here. So when I asked the students, will you meet the expectations of e-patients, before the course they said no or I don't know. After the course, it's 100% yes. Then I asked them what they think about the future of the intersection of medicine and healthcare and social media in the future. They sent me hundreds of essays. So I created a word cloud uh, for featuring the most important, most active words. And here is communication, important information, time management. They realize that internet will play a major role in their future practices in their own uh, professional life. Even if they don't have to become web savvy doctors, they have to know about these social media and virtual games related issues. And have a guess, what was the question here? Did you like the course? It was 100% yes. I guess that's a good feedback. 
So then I would like to, uh, this is the structure of the course from the basics of Web 2.0 through medical blogging, Second Life, using virtual games and virtual environments in medical education and also the health management of patients, uh, search engines, uh, Facebook for physicians, Facebook for patients, the world of e-patients, Wikipedia. So we really cover all these issues through 10 weeks, through 20 slideshows, using PowerPoint and Prezi's, using a Facebook page and a blog for a course so then students can respond to these questions and it can really be interactive the whole course for them and they really like it. That's, our, uh, that's what we think right now. So one thing for the last few slides, social itself is absolutely not new. At the University of Stanford, they did a research, they, they published a study a few months ago focusing on the letters people sent to each other in Europe in the 18th century. And based on these letters, they could create a real social network without uh, decades and centuries before the internet era. So social itself is not new. And I'm really not interested in, in the platforms or the technologies we're using day by day. What I want to see is the solutions we use for these platforms. So social media or virtual games, I believe that these are not about technology, these are about real content and solutions. So when someone wants to develop something on Facebook or Twitter, or a patient wants to communicate with a doctor in private forms through Twitter, Facebook, blogs, it doesn't matter. If I want to use something in education, a virtual solution, either in Second Life or Visual End, or through my own application, it doesn't matter. I believe that the most important point here is that first, we have to educate patients to know more about these issues, and we have to include these topics in a medical curriculum. So as they say, let's tweet in touch. Thank you for your attention.